this morning to be here for this moment. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. I will live in the house of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray.
midst of life, we're surrounded by death. With whom can we find refuge? Only with you, Lord God. Do not let us be the prey of death, but grant us eternal life through your Son's death and resurrection. In his strong name we pray. Amen. to be buried, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, confident of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we had the opportunity to pray this next prayer with Walter the last time I saw him before he passed. Walter, may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you peace. Amen. For us, this is the end. For Walter, it's the beginning. Therefore, let us not grieve as those who have no hope. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
so just be careful stepping out of that performance. Walter Dick, as written by his brother Harry. Walter Dick was born on August 10, 1939, in his parents' farm home on Graham Side Road in the then township of Gosfield North. He was the fifth child in a family of four boys and two girls. At a very young age, one thing quickly became obvious. Walt had no fear of heights. When only four or five years old, he would find and climb every ladder that had been left in place. A few years later, he would enjoy climbing to the top of our 30-foot high silo, sit on the very narrow two-inch silo wall, and then shimmy around the entire perimeter at the top of the silo. As he grew older, he was quickly subjected to all the hard work of farming and raising dairy cattle. This experience and knowledge would serve him well in his adult years. 
He attended elementary school at Gosfield SS Number no. 1, a one-room school about a mile away from his home. Almost every school day, his journey to and from school was by foot or by bicycle, as there were no buses in those days. At the age of 14, just as he was about to enter high school, Walt had the misfortune of a serious farm accident. In those days, some of the old tractors did not have electric starters, but had to be cranked by hand. On this day, Walt did not know that the old Farmall A had been left in gear, and when he cranked it, it started immediately and drove forward, pushing him up against another tractor. The large bone in his leg was totally fractured and protruding out of his leg. In those days, the use of pins and plates to repair bones was unknown. Instead, broken bones had to heal back together naturally. In Walt's case, since the bone had totally separated, the two ends were now overlapping. His, first, his leg first had to be stretched to bring the ends of the bone together before healing could begin. He spent the next five weeks in the hospital. Most of this time was spent flat on his back with a weighted pulley-in cable uh, set up attached to his leg. After leaving the hospital, he spent several more weeks in a full body cast. With the cast still preventing him from sitting upright, his father built a special cart with large bicycle wheels on the back and a smaller swivel wheel at the front, with which Walt was able to maneuver himself around the farmyard and back and forth to the tomato field. When finally able to walk again, Walt started high school at UMEI. In high school, he loved and excelled in math and sciences, but had absolutely no interest at all in any other subject. <laughs> While in grade 11, he decided to quit school and work with his dad. In the preceding years, Walt's father had become a fully licensed electrician and a self-taught plumber and was now doing residential electrical and plumbing work when not busy with farming. Walt joined his dad in this work and quickly became knowledgeable and skilled in both of these trades. In 1964, Walt married Linda Cornies. They lived the next few years in a rental house on the seventh concession and then built into a new house in the family farm in 1966. They were blessed with four children, Michelle, Greg, Joel, and David. Walt continued in the electrical trade after working for several years with his dad. He received a special permit from the electrical union that allowed him to work for unionized contractors. With this permit, he got full-time employment at Perry Electric and then domestic electric companies in Windsor, while simultaneously taking night courses at St. Clair College. In 1969, he received his electrical license and was accepted into the Electrical Workers Union. In 1970, Walt became a full-time employee of Tucker Electric in Windsor. While he had started his electrical career doing residential work, he now quickly became skilled and knowledgeable in commercial and industrial electrics as well. He soon became well known in the Windsor industrial communities and companies calling Tucker to do electrical jobs would often make special requests that Walt be assigned to their job. Because he had no fear of heights, Walt was often assigned to jobs where high, where high communication towers or lighting towers had to be climbed. This resulted in some memorable experiences, like the time he was working on a light tower at Micmac Baseball Field, when he suddenly realized the entire game had come to a halt and all players were looking at him 110 feet up as he was lying on his back with his body overhanging the edge of the platform so he could reach the faulty light. On another occasion, while nearing the top of a tall tower, he was attacked by an aggressive large bird, which he thinks was an eagle. That, unbeknown to Walt, had a nest of his raising young chicks atop the tower. He had to fend off the attacking bird with one arm while hanging on to the climbing rungs with the other, as he quickly retreated down the tower to regroup. In the year 1981, Tucker Electric was awarded the job of installing lights on the Ambassador Bridge. This was another high elevation job and Walt was assigned the task of leading this work. Overall, this job went extremely well and at the conclusion, Walt received special recognition at a large dinner event held at the Detroit Renaissance Center 
headlined by U.S. and Canadian government officials and other dignitaries. For many years, Walt continued his employment at Tucker Electric while also farming his 200 acres of land. During this time, he was also busy with all the normal events of running a household and raising a family. This included teaching the kids about farming, helping them succeed in school, uh, travel sports, and going on several family ski vacations, and as the children grew older, helping them move and get set up at universities. Walt also loved being active in sports himself, and during these years, he was introduced to the sport of tennis. His skills and love of this sport quickly grew, and he subsequently enjoyed many years as a member of the Windsor Tennis Club. After 32 years of marriage, Walt and Linda separated in 1996, and shortly thereafter, Linda and the kids moved away from Essex County. In 1998, Walt met Marlene Hawk. They married in July 2000, and made Marlene's property on the third concession of Kingsville their home. In 2007, Walt and Marlene joined a local committee known as LARC, which stands for Leamington Area Ecumenical Refugee Committee, a decision which would significantly change their lives. At the time, the refugee family being sponsored was the Bethane family. While this family had immigrated from a refugee camp in Thailand, their real homeland was Burma, now called Myanmar, where they belonged to the Karen state. Walt quickly became active helping the Bethane family and repairing things in their house. In the years to follow, Walt and Marlene resigned from Lark, but as additional Karen newcomer families arrived in Leamington, those already here were quick to introduce Walt to the new arrivals. He and Marlene became pillars in the Karen community. Over the years, Walt spent countless hours helping dozens of families with every sort of issue involved in getting their lives established, and every sort of household problem or breakdown, repairing appliances, repairing plumbing and electrical problems, repairing sewage and water drainage issues, and as required, coordinating larger home maintenance and renovation projects. He also taught his new friends how to drive, took them to driver's tests and medical appointments, helped them in dealing with government agencies of all kinds, and helped them buy new homes by setting them up and providing assistance, working with real estate and lawyers. In approximately 2010, one of the new Karen arrivals was an orphan. His name was Reasonly. Reasonly had been separated from his family at the age of 12, when he and his friends were kidnapped by the Burmese army while playing a game of soccer in their schoolyard. He and a few others managed to escape their captors and fled into the jungle where they met up with other adult Karen families. One of the families took him in, and after a few years in the jungle, this family managed to get to a Thailand refugee camp, and then ultimately to Canada. When recently arrived in Leamington, he only knew his first name. When he was taken to register for school and other things, he was told by the authorities that he needed a last name. He asked Walt if he could use his last name. Walt readily agreed, and so Reasonly became Reasonly Dick. The relationship with Reasonly suddenly became a bit more special. And while an official adoption never occurred, Marlene and Walt became mom and dad to him. A few years later, Reasonly married Abluwa. In the subsequent years, Reasonly and Abluwa had children, and Walt and Marlene became Oma and Opa and Oma, to three beautiful, loving grandchildren, Ryan, Shania, and Claire. Over the years, Walt and Marlene have touched the lives of hundreds of Karen newcomers. In return, they have felt extremely blessed to be part of that community. They have often been invited to attend large functions in the Karen Church and at other locations. And as siblings of all, we have had the good fortune of being included in many large, sometimes triple tent, birthday park, birthday, and other tribute events held in Marlene and Walt's backyard, organized completely by their caring friends. As siblings, we also enjoyed the benefits of Walt's unselfish willingness to help, repair, and provide advice whenever needed. William Bev, 
And Liz and I took numerous ski vacations with Paul Marlene, and we will never forget the wonderful experiences and memories we enjoyed on these trips. Sadly, in the summer of last year, Walt started to feel weaker and weaker and was ultimately diagnosed with cancer. He continued to run his farm until his body could no longer do so. In his final weeks, Marlene was able to care for him in their home. When this was no longer possible, he was admitted to hospital on Thursday, March the 28th. He passed away the next day on Friday, March the 29th. Walt was predeceased by his parents, Jacob and Anna Dick, his oldest brother, Neil, brother-in-law, Walter Weeby, and brother-in-law, Carl Thiessen. He is survived by his wife, Marlene, children, Michelle, Greg, Joel, and David, sister-in-law, Shirley Dick from Kingston, sister Louise Thiessen from North Newton, Kansas, sister Marion Weeby of Leeming, Ontario, brother Willie and wife Bev of Abbotsford, BC, brother Harry and wife Elizabeth of Cottam, Ontario. Walt was a wonderful individual, always willing to drop everything when his help was needed. Throughout his life, he was modest, modest but always positive and upbeat, always looking on the bright side. He remained that way to the end. He will be greatly missed.
Now I'm going to translate the lyrics of the song. The title is called Tomorrow. Our lives are past for tomorrow. None of us know what will happen to us tomorrow. Our lives come from God, comes from God, and goes back to God. We have to understand God's work. God gives, God takes away. Let the God be uh, the name of God be praised. Let the name of God be the glory. One of the one day, all of us have to go back and praise God in the presence of God. Just like grass plants, we don't get to live forever. One day, we have to return and praise the Lord. Our lives on earth, we are visitors in earth. When our job is done, we have to return to our home. Very loved and cherished person in our community. And I know that many of us will love to be up here and share with you the endless story and beautiful memories Walter has left us with and my ex Lee touched all of our lives in such positive and special ways. Walter was like a grandfather to me and to many of us in our community. Um, we will call him Cuckoo Walter, which means uh, grandpa in our language. And uh, Walter, Begin helping our current people when the first current family settled down in Leamington back in 2007, and he continued doing so since then. Um, many more of our current people and families made their way to Leamington and after, and Walter went out of his way to make sure he met every one of us. Leaving our community the greatest pleasure of having known him. Walter always tried his hardest to attend any celebration going on in the current community. I remember seeing him sitting up at the front of our church on Father's Day with such a warm smile on his face, surrounded by our people, even though he couldn't understand our language. If you knew Walter, you know he would never walk away from those who needed his help. Many of us have called him at least once, but usually more, asking for help with things like electrical works and plumbing issue, which he was really good at. Um, when Walter didn't know how to help, he would always try his best to find an answer or solution in any way he could. We as a community are so grateful and blessed to have met such a hardworking, generous, kind-hearted, caring, and loving person like him as it is very rare. I know this is a very sad and heartbreaking time for us and all of us, but Walter is now with God in heaven at peace and away from all the suffering and pain that he went through here on earth. Walter is still here with us in our heart, and if he could, he would tell us not to be sad with that very warm smile on his face and celebrate the precious memory we all are lucky enough to continue to cherish. Walter will never be forgotten. We will forever remember his kind and beautiful soul that has shown each, uh, each one of us how to be truly selfless and so given to those around us. Overall, Walter was and will always be cherished in current community, which I am honored to stand up here today and represent us and the special place that he holds in all of our hearts forever. The things Walter has done and given to us will never be forgotten. Thank you for listening and I look forward to hearing uh, the memories he has left with others and spending today celebrating his life together with all of you. Thank you, Kushi. I'd like to invite Sharon Thiessen to come forward and share our scripture reading with us this morning. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, 
that where I am, you may be also. Thank you, Sharon. Well, if you're like me, I'm sure you're finding it wonderful today to hear these stories, these testimonies to the life of Walter and Dick, and hearing just about the people who have been connected to him in life. But very early on, when I moved to Leamington uh, to take my job here at this church, I was invited by Marlene and Walter uh, to visit their home. I had met Walter once or twice before in church on a Sunday morning, but now I had a chance to sit down and hear more of his story. And I quickly heard stories very much like we've been hearing today. Uh, stories of the way Walter served and gave his life for others, uh, whether that was his work on the Ambassador Bridge or his involvement with the uh, Grand community. Two things struck me very quickly about Walter. One was that his willingness to serve had given him the opportunity to be a part of great things. And those great things would probably also include his courage when it comes to heights, something of which I'm very envious. I don't like heights myself. Uh, did anyone see those pictures of him high up on the Ambassador Bridge in the PowerPoint display? Did anyone else's stomach sink when they saw those pictures? Yes, I definitely was thinking, you're welcome to that, Walter. Walter also seemed to be someone who felt the weight of the places in his life where things had not always gone perfectly, where mistakes had been made, and where sadness had taken place. He gave the impression of a man who felt deep humility and was under no illusions that he was the most perfect man who had ever lived, but he could still love others. As Marlene and I spoke uh, earlier this week, um, we reflect on how Walter was never quick to complain, but he was always quick to serve others. And I wonder if that generosity came from his own reflection back on his life. So today we make specific time to remember Walter, to pay tribute to the gift that God gave us through his beloved child. And today we'll tell stories, we'll share tears, we'll share embraces of comfort and support to one another. Because we've known Walter, and we were the better for it. When our loved ones pass on, we often find ourselves asking two questions. What comes next after death? We also may ask ourselves, not only what do we remember about this person, but how will we remember our loved one? In the passage that we read from John 14, that Sharon read, Jesus gives a description of the future to his followers, that he's going to prepare a room for them in his father's house, which has many rooms. And the, the Greek word that Jesus uses is mone, when he says rooms. This means a place to abide, a place to dwell, a place to live in relationship with someone. Jesus is suggesting that when we pass on, we go to a place that he's prepared for us to dwell in relationship with him, and by extension, to dwell in relationship with God. A place to do everyday life with God. A place to experience joy with God. A place to experience the depth of family with God. A place to experience home. But when Jesus describes that home as my father's house, He's also making a bit of a connection to the temple in Jerusalem, which in another place in John's Gospel, Jesus calls the temple my father's house. Now, if you're not familiar with the uh, temple in Jerusalem in the first century, this is possibly the most important place of worship in Jewish religious culture. It was literally the place where God lived in and amongst his people. To enter the innermost depths of the temple was to enter God's home. And only a few specific people were allowed to enter into that specific place. But Jesus says that in the place he's preparing for us, in this house of his fathers that we go to when we die, you will live in the place where God lives. You'll live in the holiest of holies. You'll live in the inner courtyard. You'll live in the closest room there is. To God, and there's room enough for a great number of people to dwell there. There are many rooms, 
and you will get to be there too. In fact, in the whole chapter of John's Gospel, there's a strong connection between place and way. Jesus describes a place, but he goes on to describe the way to get to that place. And that way is Jesus. That way is him. It's not pay X amount of dollars, and then you'll find your home. It's not pray X amount of times to this altar, and then you'll find your way home. He says, I'm the way, a person, a person who you can relate with. And more specifically, the way is the love that Jesus exemplified, the love that he exemplified when he washed the feet of his followers as a servant. The way he exemplified when he said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. In the letters of the Apostle John who wrote that gospel, later on in his life, John would reflect and he would say, God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. When we die, we return to the Father from whence we came. We return to the embrace of the love that created us and called us his beloved children. So I think the question becomes, do we want to live in tune with that love? There's three other places in John's Gospel where Jesus says, do not be troubled. One is in the context of Lazarus, a man who he raises from the dead. And the other two times Jesus says to not be troubled, he's talking about his own death, which will also end in resurrection. Jesus says, do not be troubled, because his self-giving love has overcome the enemy of death. And he's promised that one day, too, we will be resurrected, to live in a place with many rooms, in the closest heart of God, in the closest heart of love. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Walter wasn't afraid to go to high places, to go to difficult places, to bring light, both literally and metaphorically. He brought light to high towers. Uh, even the lights up here in our church, these were installed and put in by Walter Dick. I think Marlene has described the experience of even being kind of up the ladders to, to do that here. Walter also brought light to refugee families that had escaped death to find life. And now he returns home to that light. He returns home to that love. The love that Walter discovered in the person of Jesus. How will we remember Walter? May we bring light as Walter did. May our words today and every day, the relationships that we have with one another, the words that we sing as we raise our voices in song today, may all of this bring witness to the light of love that was in Walter's life. May we live in the light of the love of Jesus, that we may find our own way to our own room and to our own home, living eternally in the embrace of God. Let's pray together the resurrection life, for the assurance and hope of our faith, and for the saints who you have received into your eternal joy, our hearts cry out in thanks. Now we lift up our hearts in gratitude for the life of Walter, now gone from among us, for all your goodness to him through many seasons, for all that he was to those who loved him, and for everything in his life that reflected your goodness. Help us to release him to you, gracious God. Assure us that in your keeping, he's secure. Surround us and all who mourn today with your unending compassion. Do not let grief overwhelm your children or be unending or turn them against you. Guide us on the course of our journey. Help us to live so that we might not be ashamed when we meet you on the last day. Bring us in the company of all the redeemed to your eternal kingdom through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
sorry. <laughs> Get underway for our meal here this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to say a word of grace, and then we'll uh, step up to uh, grab our lunches. If we can let the family grab their lunch first, that of course would be very polite. But let's uh, pray together before we enjoy our meal. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you have brought through the life of Walter, uh, this community that you've created. As we share stories and as we eat together, uh, may we feel the spirit of your son in this place and the spirit of your love. And I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So, but anyway, is there anybody here who would like to share something? Memories or reminiscing or anything like that? Okay. Sandra has a very nicely prepared um, something. I, I just want to share a quick memory because I've been thinking about it more this week and since, you know, just a, a childhood memory, I was probably five years old and since our property back on Uncle Walt's farm, um, there were lots of times when, you know, we, were, we knew that Uncle Walt was in the farm a lot or in the field a lot on the tractor and if I wanted to go out and come on the tractor, I would go to the edge of our property and I would just stand there straight as an arrow and he would always know if I was standing there that he could, he would just stop, he would open the door, I would get in and I would sit right next to him in the tractor and we didn't, we didn't really talk, we just went up and down and every time we, we did a lap he would say, you ready to get, get out? And I would say, no, not yet, so he'd do another lap, ready to get out, I'd shake my head, he'd open the door, I'd get out and and that was it. So it wasn't a lot of conversation, but it was, it was this really dear, like, you know, small toddlerhood um, memory for me that I just didn't think about. I don't speak off the cuff, so I've written it down and I'll read what I wrote. Um, generally, I'll always remember Uncle Walt as a very content person who never complained, never blamed, and always saw the good in things. But I do have a couple of fond memories that reflect Uncle Walt's patience, more specifically. Um, back in the day, Uncle Walt had a full-size van. It had big comfy chairs, a table to play games, and I always thought it was great when we got to ride in it. And I say we because at any holiday, when my cousins came from Kansas and BC and Kingston, we traveled around as a unit and spent as many minutes and hours and days together as we possibly could. So one Christmas when Uncle Walt uh, was headed to Sarnia for a hockey game, a bunch of us cousins piled in the van. I don't even know if we were asked if, if we uh, could go or not, but we just piled in and made the trip with him. And another memorable van road trip was 
a ski trip that we took to Boeing Mountain in northern Michigan. Uh, my parents and Uncle Willie and Aunt Bev declared that there was no room for the children in their car. So my sisters, me, and my cousins Danny and Kathy happily traveled as Uncle Walt's passengers in the van once again. Uh, the best part of that trip was actually on the way home. We traveled home on Christmas Day, and after crossing back into Canada, we were all pretty hungry. Uh, nothing was open, of course, because it was Christmas Day, but Uncle Walt did find one place. It was the Husky Station, um, where we stopped, and Uncle Walt treated us all to Christmas dinner, truck stop style. Um, we thought Uncle Walt was the lucky one to be hanging out with us, but I think we all realized later that we were the lucky ones to spend that time with an uncle who never complained about driving five teenagers on a four and a half hour road trip, uh, laughed at all of our ridiculous jokes, and gave us a Christmas dinner for the memory books. I think one thing that maybe hasn't been mentioned too much is Walt had a great sense of humor, and he would come up with some great light-hearted light one-liners, some of them at the most serious times. On one occasion, he was working at a tool and mold shop in Windsor. While working off a high ladder, repairing an overhead crane, the ladder began slipping sideways. The floor below was filled with large steel parts and iron molds, and he was bracing for the worst. But as he, as he rode the ladder down, he suddenly noticed a small empty opening where there were no parts. And so as the ladder was falling, he was able to jump off and land in this small open area. As he lay there, checking his own body and checked the, uh, all over for injury on himself, he came across the, the pocket on his uh, safety vest and he knew something wasn't quite right. And by then, people came running up to him and said, Walt, are you okay? He calmly looked up to them and responded, I broke my pencil. <laughs> <laughs> then as Walt relates the incident, the ladder was also twisted and bent, so he had to call the Tucker office, and they brought him out at another ladder and a new pencil, <laughs> and he finished the job. 